Guys, welcome back to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Matthias Turner, and I'm joined today by Dr. John Jaquish. John, welcome, mate. Mm, thanks for having me. Yeah, pretty excited for this one. So, I mean, uh, we, we kind of connected online, and I've seen some of you, or heard some of your podcasts, and realistically, you've got a very interesting background of where it's kind of taken you, and it, it, it seems to always come from a bit of a pain point, and your pain point was that your mom became unwell, and you wanted to figure out how to help her, how to best, how right. to best serve her. So, I think maybe if you could give us a little bit of a background just into, into you and how you kind of stepped into this line, and then what happened with your mom and how, how that all came about. Yeah, uh, we, um, I, 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 call, I think of myself as one of the luckiest people in sports performance. And the reason I think that is because the path of research and discovery that I went down led me to some conclusions that others probably would never have come to. Mm-hmm. Just because of the order in which I came across certain things. And like it was like one discovery led to another discovery led to another discovery. So, uh, what happened was my mother was diagnosed with osteoporosis. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> it was uh, probably fourteen years ago now, and she was um, very distraught about it. And uh, I, you know, like what do you say? You know, she reads yeah. about the statistics and. And so, like, I don't, and she didn't want to take the drugs because they had side effects associated. Mm-hmm. And she felt like she was too young mm-hmm. uh, to have to have that issue. And How so old I was said, she at well, the time? Uh, let's see. She was in her seventies. Yeah, she's in her early seventies. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, she didn't. She just didn't want to deal with that, and mm-hmm. and so very disappointing. And. She's like, well, I can't go for hikes anymore, and I can't play tennis anymore, and I can't do any gardening anymore, because if I break my hip, I could die. Now, hip fracture mortality rate is similar to the mortality rate of breast cancer. Yeah, it's like one in two, isn't it? Or 50% chance once you've had it, pretty much? Yeah, yeah, something like that. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, but there's a study that compares the risk of death from breast cancer to the risk of death from hip fracture. And, uh, so, you know, and one in three women are affected by fragility fractures or bone fragility in their life. So it's a big deal. Now that the deaths that result, it's usually hip fracture, hospitalization, can't recover, can't move around, get pneumonia. Mm. And then that ends up being the life ending thing. But these are all complications based on that fracture. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, my mom was devastated, and uh, I said, look, I'm going to see if there's such a thing as a group of outliers, as a group of people who have, have superhuman bone density, and we'll figure out how they did it. Mm-hmm. And once I do that, maybe I can come up with something. Because ultimately, like, as I looked at bone loss, I said, this is, this is a disuse dysfunction. Mm-hmm. Sort of like when somebody doesn't exercise – you know, when they have small muscles, we don't call that a disease. No. Right? It's yeah. just like, okay, you need to exercise. The problem with bone was there's there's really no good way to do it. Like mm. past a certain age, like like what do you do for your bone? Like kids build bone. And uh, and, and I found out why when I found who the outliers were. The outliers were gymnasts. Hmm. And it was because of the magnitude of force that they load the body with when they hit the ground. Sometimes they yeah. get 10 times their body weight Yeah, okay. through the hip joint. Right. Nobody lifts weights with 10 times body weight. No. Right. Anyway, uh, so then the other thing was um, as, as, I, as I, I made this discovery, and of course I made the joke to my mother, oh, you could become a gymnast in her 70s. That, that she didn't find that very funny. But... <laughs> I said, what if I could create a medical device that loads the body in a way where you could get the benefit of high impact forces, but not the risks Mm. of high impact? And she said, well, that sounds interesting. So that's exactly what I did. I created four fixtures that emulated the positions that humans naturally absorb impact and and then had my mother use this so that she could load the body put force through the axis of bone so this is the axis of my humerus bone axis yeah uh, of my clavicle 
and you compress that bone end to end. And now weightlifting won't do this. Okay. I don't care how heavy you're lifting because, like, like we know the most about the hip joint because those are the those are the most uh, fractures that are associated with mortality. Yeah. Um, you need 4.2 multiples of body weight to do anything. Yeah. Wow. There's not right. not many so, weightlifters that are even doing three times body weight. Like that's a right, that's a big right. accomplishment if you get even right. two times. Le- not many weightlifters doing it, let alone postmenopausal <laughs> populations. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right. So it was clear that the standard fitness recommendation of just resistance exercise was lacking. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, like now that we have quantification of what that is, I'm going to launch this impact emulation device. Now, my mother's bone loss, I mean, her, she recovered. She, she went back to the bones of a 30-year-old in 18 months. Wow. So she was better. Months, that's incredible. Yeah, she was better than anyone her age. Uh, really quickly. So, so what uh, you said that it doesn't. Nothing happens until it's at four point two. What does your machine do? Oh, it allows people to go to uh, just in the in the trial that we did in uh, London Hospital. There were women that were using seven, eight, nine times their body weight wow. through the lower extremities, through the hip joint. So it just isolates a position a human would naturally absorb high impact force, mm-hmm. and the movement may be two millimeters. Yeah. So very tiny movement, but it's that movement is the machine doesn't move. It's the bone that compresses. So how exactly does it work? Does it pretty much put a shock like through the, the body or through the, the person? Like how do you get the absorption without them going through something? It is, it is all self-created force. Wow. So in that way, your own central nervous system is keeping you from injuring yourself. Yeah, okay. Because you have a process called neural inhibition, right? Like, mm-hmm. can you squeeze a fist hard enough to break your own finger? Yeah. You can't. It's not going to happen. You know, you, your central nervous system will stop you. Yeah. It'll just start shutting muscles off. Mm. So people load in a slow and controlled manner, and then they stop being able to load at a certain point. Mm-hmm. Because muscles just shut off because that's just the maximum tolerance. But that's also the stimulation point. Yeah. So then the next time they do it, the force gets higher and higher. And it's all computer monitored. They're looking at a computer screen that's showing them exactly how much force they are creating. Mm -hmm. So how did your test go to come to create this machine? Like I feel like that would be quite a rigorous process. It was. Yeah. (laughs) The way I describe it, it sounds like I, you know, came up with this in an afternoon. It was it was months yeah. of testing, testing, capturing data, looking at differences, grabbing people who didn't have a confirmation bias like I did. Mm-hmm. And okay, you pushed last week your absolute hardest, right? And they would say yes. Okay, now I want you to try and compress this bone your absolute maximum, and they would do it. And of course, the number would just get blown away, and they're like, "Huh? Yeah. Yeah. How's that possible?" Yeah, well, there were some changes made by the body. That's how that's possible. And so then we did pre and post DEXA scans, and I got a couple of physicians on board to help me write a book. My book is Osteogenic Loading. It's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, it was, yeah, it ended up being fantastic. Filed for patents, and uh, now we have more than 100 OsteoStrong locations in seven different countries, including Australia. Yeah, so we talked about this before. Melbourne, Adelaide, and Sydney is where they are in Australia. So, so I mean, realistically, you're talking about the bones healing themselves really quite quickly. Um, however, it is a slower process than what muscle will recover at. Is that correct? Yes. Primary mineralization happens between five and ten days. Okay. And so, realistically, people would often think about, well, I go to the gym and I go to the gym daily because that's how I need to get recovery. When it comes to something like this, this isn't something that should be used every single day, is it? Oh, no. Once a week. Once a week. Never more often than once a week. Yeah. yeah to- because of that primary mineralization. Yeah. So, but think about, like, you can go for a run. And as far as from a cardiovascular standpoint, let's say you, you do something that doesn't really tax joints and muscles like an elliptical, which is, by the way, a terrible exercise. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, just for argument's sake, uh, you're on elliptical and you're not really beating up on any particular part of the body. You're just trying to tax the cardiovascular system. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Four hours later, you could go on another run and yeah. your performance yeah. would not be right. Right. So the metabolic rate of the heart and the lungs is, is very short. Mm-hmm. four or five hours 
we know from muscle biopsy research with, uh, with strength training, muscle protein synthesis concludes in 36 hours. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, now you can, if you have damage when you lift, which people should not have damage when they lift, that, that is a myth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike, micro tears have nothing to do with growth. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that's a common thing. It's like, oh, you tear the muscle and it grows back stronger. No, untrue. That, that's not how it works. Uh, you can tear the muscle and, you know, then you have to recover from that damage. Yeah. And then growth can begin maybe. So, so, but that 36 hours is, is, uh, is, that's the metabolic rate of musculature. Okay. But bone just has a longer rate than that. Yeah. So realistically, you should, you shouldn't be training the same muscle group within 36 hours of each other. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah. So like with my other product, which is more strength focused X3, mm -hmm. we have everybody on a 48 hour cycle of hitting every body part every 48 hours. Okay. So it's a one, one protocol. So one, uh, like training There's session two workouts, that everything. Do, yeah. yeah. You do workout one on, you know, Monday and then Tuesday workout two and then Wednesday repeat. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, um, of all the people using OsteoStrong, like obviously you guys have been able to collect a whole heap of data since starting that. Um, what what sort of numbers are you getting like in regards to, you said your your mom was 74, I think, and she was had the bones of a 30-year-old. How often are you seeing these numbers happen? Uh, it's pretty common. Yeah. With the people who stick with it. And now, it is a physical medicine intervention, which mm -hmm. is like like – using uh physical sciences you know an activity like phys physiotherapy as you would call it physical therapy in the united states yeah um to engage the body for a curative type protocol like looking to get the body to reverse a dysfunction mm -hmm. so um i don't remember what your question was uh like what what sort of numbers have you seen um since oh oh Right. So like with physiotherapy, your commitment to the physiotherapy has a lot to do with your results. Yeah. yeah. So somebody who skips half their sessions and Just doesn't really it. try hard when they're there. Yeah. You know, like there's some people have a knee replacement and they say, I feel as good as a teenager and other people have a knee replacement and they barely have any mobility at all. Mm, yeah, exactly. So I mean, it really has to do with that. With so recovery. you get out of it what you put into it. Yeah, and so with that, if you, you if you do put in the hard stints and you get your bones back to the thirty year old bone structure, how long does it take before that is undone? Like obviously, someone who has osteoporosis are they are they more likely to d degenerate faster than someone who doesn't have that symptom? Great question. There's a study that looks at individuals who, through uh, very high forces, increase their bone density, you know, like, like high impact type athletics, and it shows that you keep the gains of bone for Excellent. 30 years. Yeah, unreal. 30 years. That's really incredible. Yeah, not like weightlifting. You know, that goes <laughs> away right away. No, definitely. And I mean, yeah. there's a. And I mean, there's a lot of injury that comes within sports, within the gym, uh, and yeah. weightlifting and stuff like that. Like, I, I, it's something I didn't really talk to you about beforehand, but I, I do teach a fair bit of weightlifting, a fair bit of CrossFit style stuff, and we do see injuries. Like, it is, it just happens in the of sports. Um, when it comes to something like this, is this of benefit to the, that population? Like, obviously, having stronger, dense, uh, sorry, stronger and dense, more dense bones is always going to be more favorable. Like, being stronger is always more favorable. Of course. Yeah, I would I would say to anyone who's serious about especially if they want to compete. Mm -hmm. Like one of the one of the issues I see, one of the challenges with CrossFit is a lot of the measurements of progress are physical outputs. Mm -hmm. And at times when people get tired, they start to break form. Yeah. And because they want to get a greater physical output, they want to be able to see progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's where they injure. Yes. Uh, so, so I have a different philosophy on what I would want out of the human body and how I would want to track that that progress, which 
kind of goes more more into X three. But at the same time, to answer your question specifically, like if, if a CrossFit competitor is like, I want to win the CrossFit Games, you ought to do Osteo Strong to prehab yeah. yourself. So that one moment where you may break form or your weight may slip out of your hand and you have to compensate and you're going to awkwardly load something, mm-hmm. you don't cause a tear or a fracture or, or a tendinous or ligamentous injury. Yeah. Yeah. And, what, and there are CrossFit athletes who use Osteo Strong in, in this manner. Yeah. And so what is your background? So, I mean, for those who aren't, who aren't watching, um, Dr. John is jacked. Like you're a big, you're a big boy. Uh, what is your background? Is it bodybuilding? Is it powerlifting? No, no, I, I have zero. Well, I, I played rugby. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was, that was my athletic background. You saw me when I was playing rugby in undergrad. Uh, I think I weighed like 160 pounds or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I was a skinny guy. I was, I was an outside center. Yeah. I was fast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, that, that for Americans listening, that's more like a wide receiver type yeah. position, like speed. It was, I, I was always very quick mm-hmm. and, uh, and I was small. Like I was this, one of the smaller guys on the field. Um, but it, it weightlifting really never really did much mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, even though now I'm, I'm much bigger, it, it had to do with what I discovered in the process and which is why I started like it was the order in which I, I came to my various discoveries after coming up with osteo strong and launching that technology. I started looking at growth factors and different things that affected growth factors. Yeah. And I published a meta analysis uh, on growth hormone upregulation and stabilization firing. Mm-hmm. And so this is part of the reason why a lot of CrossFitters don't do a whole lot of cardio, but they can get very lean. Yeah. Because they're stabilizing themselves with weight. So you stand on one foot and yeah, you need to stabilize yourself, but it's not really aggressive activation of stabilization musculature. Mm -hmm. So there's not that much of an effect, but you add weight to that, especially heavy weight. Then you get a massive upregulation of growth hormones. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at this and then at the same time, when we did that trial in London, I was looking at the the loading that was going through this postmenopausal population. I compared it to what the American College of Sports Medicine keeps as the standard loading of what people do in a gym. It turns out I had the data that actually quantified the differences between impact ready range of motion and weakest range of motion. Hmm. And it was sevenfold different. Wow. So once you realize you're seven times more powerful in that impact ready range, that really means weightlifting in general is not very efficient. Yeah, wow. Because if, if you think about a sprinter, a sprinter uses seven degrees of flexion behind the knee, yet uh-huh. 180 degrees is available. Yeah. Why doesn't the sprinter use all 180? Yeah. Because it's inefficient. So sprinting is one of the most functional things we do. Mm-hmm. I mean, functional training is a heavily abused term. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. ultimately, like a muscle shortens at this function. So you know, there we go. Yeah, like you can call anything functional training, but um, we we don't need a lot of training to run quick. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you scare a little kid, you don't need to do sprint training with him. He knows it how to run. Off. Yeah, right. Yeah, he run away. So, uh, and, and the weight, even with a little kid, the weight will become biased on the balls of the feet the second he picks up speed, mm-hmm. you know, whereas we flat foot run when we're running sort of at a jogging pace or slower pace, mm. but you, you have a completely different stance when going for speed. So I did this research and then, and then when I, when I looked at the, the differences with loading, I thought, wow, like we should not be training with weights or if we are training with weights, we do it from a competition standpoint, Mm -hmm. like with CrossFit. But if we want to get stronger, that may not be the same approach. So the strength contest and the strength training may be something completely different. Yeah. And so that, that was what brought me to X3. So I created a, I created the world's most powerful variable resistance device so we could load the body in accordance 
with biomechanical capabilities. So, so like you have a low level of load where the joint is most likely to injure. You have a normal level of load a few inches further than that in a given movement. And then once you get to the more powerful ranges of motion, you have more load than you could ever even put on a bar in the gym. Mm-hmm. And this is going to take the muscle to a greater level of fatigue. And then greater level of fatigue will yield more growth. So there's people who get X3 and uh, six months later, they put on 20 pounds of muscle. Mm. There's lots of it. In fact, there's a users group on Facebook where 20 pounds of muscle is like that. That's fairly common with the people who really engage and do it right. That's incredible. Just from doing the two workouts that you're recommending? Or no, doing... no, not OsteoStrong. This is just X3. Okay, got you. Yes. Um, it's kind of a different market. Yeah, no, sorry, because you said with the X3 that you've got the two two exercise, sorry, two workouts you have just on rotation every 48 oh, right. hours. Yeah, yeah. Is that the that's same right. thing? Yeah, it hits the whole body, so like four movements one day, four movements the next day. And these and you are can the only, people that have seen it, the game. It exhausts you, yeah, it exhausts yeah. you so quickly, you can only do one set per exercise. Yeah, okay. So, like, the, the workout's only 10 minutes. You yeah, can't well. make it last longer than yeah. And so, I mean, let's explain the, the X3 a little bit more for the listeners. It's, um, oh, I'll let you explain it because I'll butcher it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking forward to that. Yeah. I was looking forward to it. I like hearing other people explain it because then, you know, I can go, okay, maybe I'm doing a good job explaining something and then I hear something else and I'm like, I'm obviously doing a terrible job explaining something else. <laughs> I can go for it if you want, <laughs> but uh, I think you'd do a better variation, a better okay, job. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Since you asked, yes. Uh, so, loading the body. So, like, I, I first, when I looked at variable resistance capabilities, I thought, okay, like maybe band training is the way to go. And because we've had variable resistance studies before where people added bands on the end of weights and things like that. But when you do that, you have, let's say, in a, in a bench press, mm-hmm. you have X amount of weight on your chest. Mm-hmm. And then at extension, you have 1.2X. Mm-hmm. Right? So, but what I looked at was the actual like real force curves, not an arbitrary force curve like the X versus 1.2. And then also there's a steep curve to it. So like in nearing the impact ready range, it spikes up like a hockey stick. Yes. So what I needed to do was come up with something that's not quite linear uh, more of an S curve, but could fit underneath that so we could do repetitions with it mm-hmm. and then be able to use more muscular tissue in the stronger range and truly fatigue the stronger range. You can't do that with a weight. Yeah. I mean, not really. Uh, like there's some people who do some sloppy, dangerous stuff and think they're doing it, but not really. So, um, because I always get some argument of, and I see, you know, like a, a video, somebody will post a video. Well, I can do it like this. And it, it's like, did you get that off of gymfails.com? Like that's a <laughs> terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, right, right. So, um, so what, what we can do, uh, is fatigue in accordance to our biomechanic, biomechanical capability. Mm-hmm. And, and that way, uh, it, just so much more efficient and all i needed to do was create the world's most powerful bands Mm -hmm. with latex not molded rubber most of the bands out there are petroleum yeah and uh every time you use them they stretch out so you think you're getting stronger but really the bands are getting longer yeah and uh and they're real cheap like when someone someone finds like a ten dollar band it's like yeah right it's made of garbage and you're going to use that 10 times and throw it away yeah. Uh, the latex does not wear like that. It'll last. Um, I'm told by, by the factory and all the testing they've done, their latex will last nine years minimum. Wow. So uh, then, so I created this set of banding that was more powerful than anything anybody had ever used before. But then with this powerful banding, if you took an X3 band and put it around your hands and tried to do a, and threw it around your back and then tried to do a push up with it, you may injure or even break your wrists because it'll twist your wrists. 
So, like, as soon as we start playing with this, it's like, all right, now we need an Olympic bar that manages the the load mm -hmm. because our hands and our feet interface with flat surfaces very well. Yeah, they do not interface with round surfaces well at all. Mm -hmm. And especially like with the deadlift, if somebody steps on a band and puts 300 pounds laterally through their ankle, you could break your ankle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, realistically, it's a board that has um, that has these like hooks and bits and pieces that you can attach your bands to, um, and then you. Do it's your an Olympic bar, and then a, a second ground. So there's a channel in that plate that you stand on that the band can flex and move underneath mm. underneath your feet yeah and then it's suspended so it's not rubbing against the ground and then um you can you can stretch the band and deliver force in the right places and there's a whole protocol and a whole series of training videos mm. but i'm setting it up takes minutes yeah i don't know seconds maybe uh, like I can in 10 seconds take, take it out of my bag and get into the chest press position. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and so when I do a chest press, I use 500 pounds, at just short of the top. You never lock out. Yeah. Nobody should actually ever lock out. I mean, unless they're in a competition where they have to lock out. Mm -hmm. Uh, but so the top I'll use five actually because of my height. You, there's an app that comes along with it and you enter your height and it'll tell you with each band what the maximum forces are in each movement. Yeah. So for the chest press, it's 540 pounds for me at the top, mm -hmm. which sounds like a hell of a chest press, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, it's only delivering that 540 pounds when I'm just like at that 120 degree angle of inclusion. Yeah. My arms are almost extended but not fully extended. Then... I go, let's say, 30 repetitions, and then I can't do it anymore. Then I only do half repetitions, and that may only be 300 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, like 130 kilos. Yeah. Uh, and then I, then I do a few of those, and I can't do that anymore. Now I've fatigued the muscle almost fully, and my last few repetitions are just a few centimeters okay. at the bottom. Yeah. So I fatigue completely every range of motion in accordance with its capability in that range of motion, totally devastating to the muscle, but there's also no soreness because there's no joint damage. Uh. There's no joint damage. Soreness, people think soreness is from lactic acid. You can't feel lactic acid. Hmm. Soreness is from joint damage or, or micro tears in the muscle, yeah. uh, which have nothing to do with growth. So soreness and growth have zero relationship. Uh, it doesn't mean you won't ever be sore. You know, your first time riding a bike after a cold winter, yeah, your legs are going to be sore, but that's, that doesn't mean you got a great workout. Yeah. That's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You just have to get through that period yeah. where your body's, you know, acclimating to that. But, um, also that was like part of the whole like muscle confusion theory thing, mm -hmm. which has been disproven. There's no such thing as muscle confusion. <laughs> it's so interesting. Now, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm I've come into, like, I've done a fair bit of powerlifting stuff, and we, we do do a lot of chain work and a lot of band work um, because yeah. of the resistance, and it's great. Like, I actually saw a big improvement in my lifts um, when I did transition to that. And so what I'd love to see is the difference from using the, the shitty bands that you're talking about because they do. They break all the time. They snap. And, oh, yeah, yeah I, I'd love to see the difference between doing something like that compared to doing something like um, the X3. Like now, X3. Yeah. I mean, for you, yeah. have you ever um, like gone and jumped on a, a regular bench press just to kind of see what your numbers are like and then tested and gone back and tested again to see if there's been much of an increase? In Yeah, the first year, I think I wasn't in particularly good shape when I started. Like if you saw me at the beach with my shirt off, you'd say, yeah, that guy probably works out. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that year, I put on 30 pounds of muscle. Yeah. Uh, and so at the end of that year, it was like, wow, like people were stopping me on the street yeah. and right. And I lost uh, a bunch of body fat. And in two years I ended up putting on another 15. So 45 pounds of muscle gain, 16 pounds of body fat lost. Uh, I look like a completely different person. Now, just in the first year I went from being able to do like 11 pull-ups now, not tipping pull-ups or no, just you know, jerky street. jumping off the ground pull-ups like slow and controlled, you know, one, 
to like that, that yeah. kind of cadence. Uh, and I could do like 11. Okay. And then at the end of that year, I was doing 35. Yeah. Wow. And that, and I, I didn't do any pull-ups in between. No. Yeah. That was just test to test. Mm -hmm. Now I would never do a heavy bench press. It's just not the risk to reward ratio is just not there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, okay. and I'm also like kind of trying to prove a point. I don't want anyone to say that, you know, the one time I bench pressed, oh, that's where all my that's where your muscles came from. Came from. Because, <laughs> yeah, because, because I think the, the people who have trouble absorbing a new type message, you know, it's, it's pretty industry disruptive what I'm saying. Mm, yeah, definitely. And so you say something new and a lot of people don't take the time to understand a new concept or, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking to Jordan Peterson here. Uh, he's pointed out a lot of people actually lack the intelligence mm -hmm. to be able to understand any new concept. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, like this is a significant portion of the population. Yeah. Like I even the concepts that they do believe in, they believe in because they see it work. You know, they, they know a, a wheel needs to be round to roll, but do they really understand that? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. So, so it's difficult when you're, when you're trying to tell somebody that everything they've been told may actually have a better approach. Yeah. Now, I mean, obviously form is still a thing. You still need to make sure you're moving correctly. Um, absolutely. It's still yeah, a big there's a movement pattern it, to like, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolute efficiency, slow and controlled, no jerky type movements. Mm -hmm. And so is it, is there X3 coaches available at all or is it all just online through the app and can you film yourself and send it in and say, Hey, am I doing this right? You can film yourself and put it on the forum mm -hmm. and there's probably 150 helpful people that are always on there that yeah. will help critique. Uh, and then there is videos through the app. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, and I mean something with you personally did your diet change much over that that year from so putting I, on the extra great question yeah i've been ketogenic for 13 years okay so i read body opus mm -hmm. 13 years ago which is not a very good book it's really like 25 things you should probably never do yeah uh you've heard of body opus i have yeah 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 it's just like like the guy the i was told it was about getting performance advantages really it's about cheating in sports but um the one thing that was in there that i because i read everything and i was fascinated like you know just taking handfuls of ephedrine mm -hmm. and sudafed before like you know you you sprint yeah and i'm like that's a cardiac disaster exactly why would you do that <laughs> like you're working out to be healthy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to induce not to induce uh you know some cardiac issue yeah so uh you know i i uh, I, I read this whole book and the one thing that was in there was ketogenic nutrition mm -hmm. and i thought like okay i'll actually try this and i got leaner mm -hmm. i got stronger my focus was better and so i i was i was a big fan of that yeah. now i was still eating a lot of vegetables mm -hmm. uh so i my i stuck with my same nutrition for the first year of my x3 training yeah and then the second year i switched to carnivore okay so yeah november 2017 was the last time i had anything other than meat wow so there's literally been no little slip-ups there with the meat side of things it's all meat no no i hey you know if i get a piece of steak and it's got some chimichurri sauce on it and i get like five grams of carbohydrates like eh. yeah yeah i'm not gonna cry about it uh but you know, basically nothing like in, you don't even get knocked out of ketosis. And the mm -hmm. argument is like, is it 70 grams? Is it 50 grams? Is it 40 grams? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't, I've not had a day where I had more than 40 grams. Here's another thing. Um, in America, um, especially in the South, uh, ribs are a big thing. Yeah. You know, like pork spare ribs. Uh -huh. like that's it's like it's, when you go to like Tennessee, one of the best things you've ever eaten. And they, there's sugar in that sauce that yeah. they put on those ribs. And so, yeah, I mean, I try and like take a napkin and wipe most of that stuff off. Uh, -huh. uh but you know, you get a little bit and it's like, it's not, it's not affecting anything. So for you, how many, like how much meat are you eating in a day? 
Uh, great question. Uh, because I weigh 100 kilos, 220 pounds. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll try and get a, a gram per pound of body weight, or 1.2 grams per kilogram. Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, you know, almost uh, like a pound and a quarter. Or, yeah. I'm sorry, two pounds and a, and a quarter, or or uh, you know that but much. That's all you're consuming of a day. There's no extras. Like, you, what are you having drink wise and things like that? Is there anything that anything else that could potentially give to it? Like, I, I, the reason I ask is that I know that there's listeners that would be like, oh, great, I'll just go and do that. And they'll go and consume other things <laughs> that will take them out of that. <laughs> right. The favorable right. State. Well, yeah. like, what's killing people? Is it sugar or is it sugar and fat together? Mm. Yeah, like, generally the sugar it's, and fat. It's the sugar and fat together, yeah. right? So, like... You know, cholesterol is not what people thought it was. Cholesterol mm-hmm. is a fat transporter, mm-hmm. right? So if you fast for 48 hours, your, your low-density lipoprotein uh, goes up. Mm-hmm. The bad cholesterol goes up when you have nothing to eat for 48 hours. And it's because your body is metabolizing its own body fat. So saying there's such a thing as bad cholesterol is just incorrect. Yeah. Because that, because if it is bad for you and you want to keep that down, that's like saying weight loss is bad for you, right? Yeah. Like that, that's just irresponsible and ignorant. And it was ignorant when those uh, those those studies came out in the you know early 1960s. So we know more now. Mm-hmm. So it's it's just it's not it's not something to be concerned with. But you have high fats and you throw a bunch of sugar on top of that, then that becomes a problem. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, but I'm just not having any, sh- you know, hardly any sugar anyway. How about fats? So, do you add in much extra fats, like healthy fats at all? I mean, nothing I add in. Yeah. Just in the meats. Just in the meats. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you, my program is pretty much the same as Dr. Sean Baker. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. if you follow him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, just meat. Just that's it. I, I don't really, I don't do organ meats unless, Somebody happens in the ground beef, throw a liver in there. Mm-hmm. Not that I would case. even know. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Right. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Also, proportionately, like a steer uh, weighs 500 pounds mm-hmm. and it has a two pound liver. Mm-hmm. So if we're to eat liver in proportion to, you know, like, so I, I should probably have some liver like once a year because how long would it take me to get through a 500 pound cow? <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, it's just so. That's funny. Like, I never thought of it like that. Yeah. That's an interesting way. No, I think I'm, I'm, I'm the, uh, Baker and I are the, I think the only one saying that. Yeah. He said it first though. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, give him credit. Uh, yeah. But like, if you just look at, because like, you hear people going off on this tangent about organ meats and, they're certainly not bad for you, mm. but, and yes, there are a lot of vitamins and minerals. Here's a statistic that will blow your mind. Your listeners will love this one. Good. Hit me. By the way, your opening notes, you got to talk about everything that we talk about, not just bone density, because I don't want anybody to like stop listening. Because it's just <laughs> uh, t- I want you to take a guess. How many calories you would need if all you were to eat is whole foods, just Vegetables, fruits, meats, like no supplements, no powders, uh, no dehydrated stuff. You are just eat whole foods. How many calories on average would it take for you to get to your recommended daily intakes of vitamins as ascribed by the American Medical Association? Just mm. take a guess. Let's say for a male or female, or it doesn't matter, say 2,200. They're the same. 2,200 calories. 2,200? 27,000 Wow, per day. So clearly the vitamin recommendations are Ridiculous. irrelevant. Yeah. They're stupid. Yeah. 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 Like, so, you know, when somebody says, well, you're only eating meat, like, what about this vitamin, that vitamin? And I'm like, well, I don't care because it's, it sounds an awful lot like those recommendations were written to sell vitamins mm-hmm. because nobody, no one ever ate 27,000 calories. No. I mean, no human did. Maybe an elephant does, but, uh, <laughs> You know, the American Medical Association is not tracking the health of elephants. Mm. So it's, I didn't care about that. And then when you look at 
some of the anthropological studies, the, the, the species, the, the not species, the, the populations that would thrive were the ones that were meat based. Yeah. Yeah. So, definitely. yeah. So that's just the direction I went. And also, I think we need to stop as a society thinking that you need to source food from every continent on earth to be healthy. Because mm -hmm. we're all here for a reason. It's because our ancestors were thriving. Yeah. They didn't get anything from anywhere other than like the field behind them. Mm -hmm. So we need to like chill out on the whole. I need to have nut butters from India. And then I need to have my imitation milk from, you know, inland China. And I need to have something else from Australia. And I need to have my salt from the Himalayas. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't need any of that. Yeah, definitely. No, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm really getting into the hunting and gathering side of things a bit more. And it's, it's crazy to see what you can actually get just in your like backyard. And really, there's so many weeds and herbs and stuff that we can eat here in Australia that have we've been told for so long are so bad and you just need to spray them with weed killer. But it's like, no, really, there's actually so much that you could get just from your backyard if you wanted to. Sure. Um, right. Yeah. And then, yeah, like I'm sure you've eaten kangaroo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. And they eat all that stuff. They concentrate those vitamins and then you go eat the kangaroo, you the kangaroo. and you got them all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so well, I, mean, I ate kangaroo the other day. I was I was in Sydney a couple months ago. What did you think of it? I, was, I got to hang out with Pete Evans. It was great. Uh, I love Australia. Now, kangaroo meat is a little tough, <laughs> but it's a little tough. Yeah. Uh, however, however, it's wild. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, no, like I think one of the Americans that was there was like, was this grass fed? You know, and they looked at the guy like, you know, we don't like farm those things, right? Like they're a menace. Yeah. Like they're, they're like awful. They jump in front of car cars and kill people all the time. Yeah. So yeah, we like try and keep population controlled and that's where the kangaroo meat comes from. But, um, tons of vitamins yeah. in kangaroo meat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and the ones you need. Mm. So just focus on that. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Um, you actually sparked my my mind a little bit around bone density and something we're often told is that we need to have a high amount of calcium um, and then we're commonly pushed mm. towards the dairy factor of, hey, well, mm -hmm. if you, need to get, yeah, oh, you need to get dairy in because that's going to give you your daily calcium. Um, <laughs> it's actually something that we don't really push a lot of. In fact, that we, we find a lot that dairy is quite inflammatory to a, a lot of different people, um, like lactose in particular, and once they've pasteurized and homogenized it, they take away the lactase from the milk. So a lot of people just how about, can't. How about casein? Yeah, and you casein. Know, casein is a huge, I have a casein allergy. I can't, yep. I can't drink milk without like just coughing and mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, that, that kind of thing. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah. it's something that we, we often steer people away from or we try to. It's just that yeah. so many people love dairy. They love milk. They love cheese. They love anything that comes from a, a cow. Um, first thing is that dairy is to grow small mammals into big mammals. So a lot of the time we'll get these people who are trying to lose weight and they'll say, Hey, I just want to add my cheese back in. It's like, yeah, you could, but also it's not going to be that favorable for your weight loss. But on a right. bone density side of thing and actually the calcium side of things, can we talk a little bit more about dairy and what you've found through studies? So calcium is the only mineral that your body will self-regulate. Like, so magnesium or zinc, they're in your system. If you eat magnesium or zinc and if you don't, then they're not there. Yeah. Uh, but the less calcium you take in, the more your body hangs on to. Mm -hmm. And so when bone density starts going down, people start taking calcium thinking, oh, I'll replace what my body's losing. Yeah. But because it's in such an abundance you start losing your bone density faster because the body's like, oh, we got calcium everywhere. So we don't even need to hold this stuff in the bone. It's crazy. It finds a new homeostasis and that new homeostasis is being inundated with calcium. Mm -hmm. So are, is calcium supplementation important? I would say not really. Yeah. And it, it's hard for me to say that because I'm really going against convention and mm -hmm. There's no, there's a lot of business in telling people they need to have calcium and vitamin D because there's a lot of very expensive supplements that revolve around this. Even pharmaceutical companies have gone into supplement business. Yeah, calcium and vitamin D. 
And, you know, your body makes its own vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And it'll hang on to calcium if you give it a reason to. Yeah. That reason would be osteogenic loading. Okay. So, like, the cal- here, like, th- this is, your, your, your listeners are going to totally understand this. So, you look at a weightlifter. The weightlifter lifts weights and then has extra protein in the diet to build muscle. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets that. Even little old ladies get that. Yeah. Like, as I say this to, I say this, sometimes I'll speak in front of a thousand uh, older, you know, the older, older population when there's just like a, like an osteo strong event or something like that. And I say, okay, so we all understand the weightlifter and everybody nods. Yeah. A weightlifter. Okay. Imagine if they just had the protein and they stopped lifting weights, would they build any muscle? You know, and they all kind of go, no, not at all. Right. So why would you expect to absorb minerals in your bone? If you're not stimulating the bone, yeah. When protein would not get absorbed in muscle, if you're not stimulating the muscle, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. Yeah. So I would say it's it's the force that's gonna gonna make the biggest amount of difference. So one thing in the in the clinical data that we have, which is just just a few, uh, there's small there's smaller studies when compared to like pharmaceutical studies, but they're of appropriate size when looking at physical medicine type research. When we look at what happened to these individuals, I made sure that the researchers put in the exclusionary criteria if they were taking bone density supplements. So everybody that was studied was taking nothing. Mm -hmm. No supplements, no medications, nothing. And they were eating a standard, it was done in London, so standard Western-ish diet. Yeah. Uh, right. And so that's not particularly calcium heavy. Mm. Uh, and they all gain bone density. Yeah. It's incredible. So where the bone density come from? Well, the calcium they were taking in the body's like, Oh, we need this and we're going to hang on to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. That weightlifter analogy is like absolutely perfect because everybody yeah. gets that. Yeah. I really like that. That is good. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we've touched on a lot, but Something we haven't really talked about is obviously with the osteo strong, they have to go to an osteo strong place to be able to use these machines. Um, whereas for your X3s, that's something that they can have in the house. And obviously, if they've got their app, they've got their X3 set up, they can take it anywhere. Um, that's where, right. where can they get an X3 from? Well, do uh, most of your listeners live in Australia or are you all over? They're, they're all over, but uh, Australia is probably 75% of it. And then we've got people in kind of okay. states in Europe. So, yeah. So for Australians, I would say contact Osteo Strong in Australia. Yep. Okay. Uh, call the um, the Melbourne, or M- you guys pronounce that a little bit differently than an American would. Just a but bit then I, slow. it's like if I pronounce it the Australian way, everyone's just like, "You're such a like, don't do that." Oh, we weird. get we got most most Americans come over and they're like Melbourne. Is it Melbourne? Me- right, yeah. right. 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 Whereas we, we well yeah. Also, you know m- most. Most of everything in your country and in my country came from the British. Yeah. So, you know, customs, laws, things like that. You know, we have um, um, in the United Kingdom, in northern England, there's a city called Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And then in the United States, it's Birmingham. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, well, you know, somebody... An American goes and says, I want to go to Birmingham. And, you know, of course, the Englishman is just like, what an idiot. <laughs> but it's, it's just, that's just the way we say it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, it's fine. So you <laughs> yeah. notice I didn't say Melbourne. Yeah, you, you Melbourne. did a very good effort, yeah. Yeah, I try and come right in in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> you did well. So Melbourne yeah. is the best place for them to, to get in contact with Osteo Strong uh, for the X3. Yeah, if you want X3 in, in Australia... For anywhere else in the world, just buy it off x3bar.com. Yeah, it's unreal. And it, it's it's the cheapest home gym you'll ever have. Yeah. It has double or triple the capacity of most like home fitness type products mm-hmm. because based on the biomechanics, you need it. Yeah. Because of the way it delivers force and it will trigger growth so quickly. Uh, yesterday, a video of Tom Brady came out mm. uh, uh, using it. Yeah, cool. Uh, I don't know if you know you know yeah, Tom yeah, Brady. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he, yeah. Okay, good. He's well yeah. talked about here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's insane. So yep. um, that's a that's a good little little part for you to have, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. uh, and so I mean, what what movements are the people doing on these on the X three squat, deadlift, press, pull? So there's the standard program probably looks more like a bodybuilder's program. Uh huh. And so, like when I was on the Ben Greenfield podcast, he was like, "Okay, like I understand the deadlift and I understand the squat." And the overhead press, all great, you know, activating the whole body. It all works together. Very, very in tune with CrossFit, very in tune with like the trends and exercise. And then he's like, but you also do like calf raises and bicep curls, single joint movements. Like, why would you do that? And I think he thought he was really going to like throw me off by saying this. And I'm like, oh, vanity, Mm. you know, yeah, like chicks dig guys with big arms. (laughs) Yeah. And there's like a long pause, and he says, "I got nothing." <laughs> Good. Like I, I was, I thought you were going to come up with some scientific answer to say like why you'd want to do bicep curls. No, there's no scientific answer to bicep curls. Just, just got girls like arms. guys with big arms. Yeah. Because some girls want big arms. Yeah. Just, yeah I definitely. guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. If, if if they want to. Now, I would say if they don't, stick to the bent row, mm-hmm. which is a multi joint movement. Yeah. And uh, you know, don't. Don't do the bicep curl. You can definitely skip one of the movements. Um, now, my my calves look like somebody glued a ribeye on the back of each one of them. So, like, the single joint movements still work. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted calves like that. Yeah, and I'm definitely. pretty happy with it. Oh, they're awesome. They're just just hard and covered with things. <laughs> um, badass. Have you seen Have you seen that people have used it and not been able to? Uh, like, it's been too too heavy for them with the bands that you've got, or is it? Like, has there been, for instance, a little old lady who's come across and used the X3 and said, hey, it's actually too hard for me to use? There's there's a recommended lower band. Okay. But the, the one that ships with it is, is like, it comes with four standard, and then there's a fifth optional that's called the Elite Band, which yeah. is for really strong people. Okay. Um, so most people won't need the Elite Band, at least right away. Because mm-hmm. people do get strong very quickly, and then they do need it. Yeah. But uh, I would say that... Uh, if somebody needs a, a lighter one, like we we recommend where to where to find that lighter. But that may be like two percent of the people who get it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it's yeah. unreal. It, it it almost sounds too good to be true. Like there's so many people who don't like going to the gym. So many people who don't don't like stepping outside the comfort of their own home. And realistically, this is something where you do still have to put in effort. And we don't want to we don't want to pull the wall across anyone's eyes. I don't think you ever have. But it's like wow. you guys still need to get in. You still need to do it. And it's only 10 minutes every other day. But still, you have to put in the effort. And you have to do the work. It's 10 minutes every day. You just split okay. the body too. Ah, uh, got you, right. Sacha. Yeah. Right. I, so so uh, Dr. Baker has some great comments about the difficulty of what, what I call diminishing range fatigue. Mm-hmm. So first you fatigue the strong and then the mid. And then that's how all the sets go. And that's how all the videos instruct you to do it. He said a lot of people who've been accustomed to lifting weights give up early. Mm. And like it's a level of fatigue that nobody's used to. Okay. So I he says I understand why you only do one set because you cannot do another one. Yeah. So it's not an easy workout, but it's quick. Yeah. And I, I find that the vast majority of people, the reason they don't work out is not because they're lazy. It's because yeah. they just don't have time. Mm. You know, or or you have a little kid running around your house and you gotta make sure that you know kids are like suicide machines. They're trying to put a <laughs> fork in a light socket or whatever. Yeah. And right, you gotta watch them all the time. This is something where you can have the kid be occupied with a toy or something like that and you can do a set and you know be right, you know, two two meters away from your kid. Mm-hmm. Right in the living room. You're not going to drop any weights because there aren't any. Yeah. And it's, it ends up being very safe. Yeah, that's incredible. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big opportunity. And, and also, like, the time. Somebody says, I, you can't get a workout in 10 minutes. Yeah, you can if you fatigue in accordance to your biomechanics. Yeah. Just nobody's experienced that before until you use this product. Mm. And, uh, and then, then, of course, the growth. is yeah. like, Especially if you, if you want to get bigger and leaner. This is just the ultimate because 
it's stimulating the body to a degree that you just aren't getting. And a- after turning 40 years old, I put on 45 pounds of muscle. Yeah, which is unheard of in a lot of people, right? Like, oh, that, why, once you're 40, you don't have the testosterone to put on size anymore. Like, it's the, the typical right. thing that gets said. So that's incredible. E- even even people now, – now, I do have a prescription for a testosterone replacement therapy. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah, but t- testosterone huh, – it's so funny – Internet commenters don't understand the word replacement. Mm-hmm. Like, you're replacing something that should be there. So, you know, ultimately, somebody with testosterone replacement, uh, they're not given, you know, anything that's going to turn them into bodybuilders. Otherwise, 18 year olds would all look like bodybuilders. Yeah, exactly. Right? And they look like twigs. Yeah. Or they're obese. Usually, it's one of the two. Mm-hmm. So, uh, right? I mean, you know, with rare exception. Yeah. So it's it's the testosterone's not not the not the issue. In fact, I've had TRT since I was twenty eight years old. Yeah. Wow. And uh, yeah, so like up until the time I was forty, it didn't do anything for me. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And and then it, it had a great effect uh, after the superior exercise stimulus with X three. Yeah, that's unreal. All right, well, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap. So, Dr. John, thank you very much. It's been really cool. Um, Well, yeah, I'm excited to kind of see what what the listeners think and what X3 can do in the in the like the near future. I think it's going to be really quite, um, I don't know, almost like revolutionary to what what we've previously had and what we've what we've seen in the world. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it'll add to uh, the CrossFit population too because people who do this to grow and then go compete, mm-hmm. they're going to have such an advantage. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's it's good for the workplace, it's good for the home, it's good for a, a, any extra gym space. Like really, if you're doing yep. accessories in a gym, it would be perfect for that as well. So if not your actual main supplement, like your main thing that you're doing. So This will blow your mind. Mm. One third of our customers, right about one third, a couple months later, they buy a second one. And mm. you know, we email them like, was this a mistake? And they go, no, I want to keep one at the office and one at home. Hmm, that's unreal. Yeah, that way I was just like, there's no way I'm missing my workout. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. And I mean, for 10 minutes a day, that is so simple. Yep. That's unreal. Well, thank you very much. Where can people find you? Where can they follow along? Uh, it's uh, Dr. John Jaquish on my, my last name is spelled J A Q U I S H uh, on Facebook. Uh, there's also the X3 Bar Facebook page. And uh, then on Instagram, it's D R J A Q U I S H. Unreal. That's really cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for the chat, mate. It's been awesome. really cool. It's been really insightful. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome.